So today is a setup. We're going to do a two-part series starting today. Today's message is entitled this, Settling for Christian. Settling for Christian. It's a setup, okay? This, is a, this, this message today is a challenge to church people. Now, if you're here today and you're not a church person or you're watching online and you would say, I am not a church person, I was forced to come to church today, or... Um, I just curiously clicked this link to see what was going on with all the lights and the music in this room. Um, if you're not a churchgoer, that's okay. I really think that you're going to enjoy this message today. It might have some information that will speak to you today. And when I say not a churchgoer, I don't just mean during this time of COVID-19. I'm talking that you are either unchurched or de-churched. Has anybody ever been de-churched in their life? You went to church as a kid, you hated it, you didn't like it, so you stopped going, you were then de church So that's not really my targeted audience today. My targeted audience is those who would call themselves churchgoers, they would call themselves Christian. That's kind of the audience today, but everyone else will get along on this one as well, okay? Let's get started. If you were raised the way that I was raised, then you believe this statement that I'm about to make. Okay? Now, you may not have been raised this way. You may have been raised the opposite, but this is how I was raised. Becoming a Christian is easy. That's how I was raised. Becoming a Christian is easy. You pray a prayer of salvation. You believe in your heart, confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bam! Christian! You can go buy the fish bumper sticker and put it on your car. You can go buy the WWJD t-shirt and bracelet and rock it. Bam. That easy. You prayed. You believed. Christian. Huh? But I studied the Bible. And if you studied the Bible, you'd see that three quarters of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. And you'll find no stories of people becoming Christians. You won't find a single story in the Bible of people becoming Christians. In fact, the word Christian is only found in the Bible like three or four times in the entire Bible. Strange, right? Yet we hang our entire identity on this word, put it big on the screen, Christian. Christian. Is it up on the screen behind me? I don't want to turn around and look. Christian wasn't a thing people became. First century Christians did not call themselves Christians. In fact, non-Christians called them Christians. It was a harsh term. It was slanderous. It was a mockery that they called somebody a Christian. It was a way that they made fun of these people who believed in Jesus. So the word Christian means, and and what they meant it to mean was, Christian meant one associated with Christ. One who is associated with Christ and his teachings. Or a Christ one. Oh, you're one of his. You follow the way. You follow Christ or Jesus' teachings. And it wasn't a static term like being American or being Canadian, it referenced a way of life. You know, like being American is not technically a way of life. It's just the fact that I was born in America, so I'm American. It's a static term. This word Christ one or Christ or Christ like one was a decision people made to live a lifestyle. It was more closely related to being a vegetarian or a vegan. You don't have to be a vegetarian. You choose to be a vegetarian, right? That that sort of thing. The term, like I said, is only mentioned three times in the Bible. And Luke, the Apostle Luke, actually uh, shows us the very first time in the Bible that it ever happens. It was in a metropolitan city called Antioch. And in telling us that the term was used he actually tells us the definition in explaining what happened. So let's check it out in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. 
And it's in the second half of the verse. If you're in your Bible, you're online trying to look this up. It's not the very first part of uh, Acts 11, 26. It's the second half of the verse. It says this. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So the first time it ever happened, the first time it ever took place was at Antioch, this metropolitan city. And how does Luke define Christians? It was the, I bolded them, guys. The disciples were called Christians. That, this, isn't the, this isn't the setup part. This isn't the trick question. The disciples were called Christians. Disciples were made fun of. Disciples. The people that committed themselves to the teaching and the learning of the word were called Christians. And that's the definition. A disciple is a Christian. So then we must ask ourselves, how are these people disciples? How are these people disciples? Because if, if you don't have a whole lot of church background, how many disciples do you think there were at this time? Twelve. The twelve disciples. No. No. Originally they were called disciples, but they're really the twelve apostles. At this moment in time, there's thousands of disciples. There's thousands. Like, um, when, when, when they're preaching and the Holy Spirit falls and, and they're preaching and, well, the Holy Spirit ain't falling because Jesus is still on earth, but when they're feeding the 5,000, people became believers. They became disciples. Hundreds, thousands of people are now following the way. They're following Jesus. This isn't talking about just 12. This is talking about crowds of people. And these people chose to be ready for this. It's going to come up on the screen. They chose to be Jesus followers. They chose to be Jesus followers. These people associated themselves with Jesus before his crucifixion and after his resurrection. They were members of, his, of the way. They were members of this new movement that Jesus was bringing about. And the reason that we believe it was a nasty term is because these first century Christians were accused of being part of a cult or a sect. This church was actually, has been accused of being a cult because we believe in the, the, the gifts of the spirit and, and the, being a spirit-filled church and, and speaking in other tongues. And so, you know, you're always gonna be called something when you do something different than the norm, all right? They accused them of being part of what they called the Nazarene sect or the Nazarene cult. They couldn't call them disciples because they had disciples. Do you get this? They couldn't just make fun of them and say, oh, you guys are disciples because those religious leaders had their own disciples. And that term disciple meant something to them. So, well, they're not disciples. They're something else. They're part of a cult. Let's call them Christ ones. Christians. Christians. And it's a term that we hold on to today. So here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. I start out by saying I have a challenge to church people. I'm going to ask this question. Ready? Are you a Christian or are you a Jesus follower? Are you a Christian or are you a Jesus follower? Because what I said in the beginning, becoming a Christian is easy. Having the t-shirt is easy. Having the bumper sticker is easy. Retweeting Joel Osteen is easy. <laughs> it's easy. Christ follower? Today, are you following after Jesus' teachings? In society right now, in the split in culture, in the splits in America, in the splits of politics, are you following Jesus 
or are we following our own ways with the Christian t-shirt on? Do I follow Jesus' example or do I merely believe in him? Right there, we could just, we could just, we could have church right there. Do I follow Jesus' teachings or do I say, yes, I believe that he is Lord? Do I follow his example or am I just trying to be a good example? Oh my God. Oh my God. This is what makes our belief system. Christianity is so scary to me. This is what makes Christianity scary to me. Because you can define and redefine Christianity any way it suits you. Any way it suits you. You can define and redefine the slanderous words of Christianity any way it suits you. I'm a Christian, but I have my own cultural background. Oh, because I forgot that all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become... See, that's a Jesus teaching. This is why there's so many denominations. Well, I like this part of the Bible, but I don't like this part of the Bible. This part of the Bible has worked for me, but the whole spirit-filled thing, that didn't work for me. So that must have passed away with the apostles. And we pick and choose, and we separate scriptures to suit what fits us, what we enjoy, but do we follow Jesus. Someone didn't like the certain interpretations of Scripture, so they rebelled and they started their own church. And it's scary. It's scary because if we follow Jesus, it wouldn't be so. If we were Jesus' followers, we wouldn't have so much division in church world. Becoming a Christian costs you nothing. Following Jesus always costs you something. And here's what I've seen in scriptures. Here's what I've seen in scriptures. Ready? The ones it cost the most made the most difference. The ones it cost the most made the most difference. And here's what we do not want to admit with the way society is today. We, we, do not want to, we do not want to admit the fact that being a Jesus follower may not be socially acceptable. Being a Jesus follower means that we live a life that is actually countercultural to the times. Come on, just hear me out just for a few more seconds. I'm not trying to cause a, like, a rebellion here or anything like that. Do our times in society follow the way that Jesus lived? Let's even look at Jesus' times. Did Jesus' times that he lived in, did society match his calling and his purpose? <laughs> Jesus was a rebel. He... <laughs> They killed him because he was rebellious against, he said, I've come to bring the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of man. So, not to be a downer, but let's look at the most quoted sermon of all times. Bigger than any other sermon out there. Bigger than Kanye West Sunday sermons. The most popular sermon of all times is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. The, ready? The most quoted sermon, but the least lived. The most quoted sermon, but the least lived. Let's take a look at it in Matthew 5, in verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, these are his disciples, crowds and crowds of people, not just 12. He went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came with him, and he began to teach them. Now, let me just tell you how I study the Bible. This crowd had no idea that they were about to hear the Sermon on the Mount. 
This crowd had no idea that they were about to be part of the biggest, best sermon of all times. They had no idea that they were showing up and that they were going to be on the album. You get what I'm saying? That, that would be like us shooting a music video, not telling you we were shooting a music video. You showed up today and you were part of the biggest worship song music video ever. That's what these people are signed up for, sitting in, and they don't know it. Okay? They don't know it. Most popular sermon, and these people get to hear it firsthand. And before their eyes, Jesus takes their culture, he takes their society beliefs and values, and he flips them upside down. He, he totally does. Ready? Jesus says stuff like this. You're not ready for this. He says, love your enemies. Huh? Huh? Love your enemies. Ready? He says, give away your stuff. Facebook marketplace, baby. I can get some money for this. Get some money for my junk. <laughs> if someone asks you for a little, give them a lot. This is what the Sermon on the Mount says. If someone asks to borrow you something, let them borrow it and don't expect to get it back. Sermon on the Mount says, go the extra mile. Do you know where that came from? In, in these times, if a Roman soldier made you carry his gear... You were, you were by law required to carry it one Roman mile. So when you drive up the highway and you see those little 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, those little highway markers, those are actually Roman mile markers. Still, still, we still use it today. And you were required to carry it one Roman mile. That's why they put the markers so you know when your obligation was up. Jesus says, yes, by law you have to carry it one mile, but go another mile. Because the first mile, you're under obligation. The second mile, you're in control. He says something I don't ever understand. I never understand. I got to talk to him when I get to heaven. He says, turn the other cheek. Someone slap you in your face on this side. Give them that side. Come on. He says you can't be right with God until you're right with the people around you. He says stop looking at the speck in your brother's eye, but first clean the speck out of your eye that you can see clearly what's going on with your brother and help them. This sermon turned everything upside down. He goes on to say, because listen, he says, you've been taught. Here's the law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the law. That's what you've been taught. That's the culture. But I say, do good to those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It was epic. It was disturbing. People were annoyed, but they couldn't get enough. Tell me more. He turns their culture values on its head. Then he drops the mic and walks away and heads to Capernaum. He bounces. He doesn't even go in and explain it all. He just gives them a list. Stop doing this, do this. Stop doing this, do this. Stop doing this, do this. Sermon on the Mount. Drops the mic, walks away. Check this out. In Matthew 7, verse 28, when Jesus had finished these sayings, saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. They never heard somebody so audaciously break customs and laws. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as one of the teachers of the laws. He spoke with authority. He spoke as a matter of fact. He spoke as if it was infallible truth because he wrote it. He wrote it. Then watch this. It jumps over to the next chapter, Matthew 8, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds, what? They followed after him. They followed in what he was doing. They followed the teachings. They say, this 
is the truth. This resounds in my spirit. This makes me come alive. This makes me want to be a better person. They followed Jesus. They didn't say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm going home to eat lunch. They said, because of what I believe, I must follow this truth. Because of what I now believe, I must do what I was taught. Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount, the best sermon ever. And guess what happens right after that? A test to practice what you preach. Isn't this just like our lives? We come out our face. We come out our face. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. And now you're invited to every barbecue, every weekend. For real? For real? You want to lose 10 pounds? Let's see. Let's see how bad you want to lose, right? We come out our face. I'm going to get out of debt. And then the washing machine breaks. I'm going to get out of debt. You go get an oil change. They tell you you need new tires. Come on, this is real life. Jesus preaches all this. Here's the way. And then Matthew 8, verse 5. I'm sorry, Matthew 8, verse 2. A man with leprosy came and knelt down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me of this disease. If you are willing, I mean, I just heard what you said. You said, love those who are unlovable. Do good to those who don't deserve it. I'm just saying that if you really meant everything that you just said, then you could fix me. Jesus reached out his hands. He touches the man. He says, what? I am willing. I am willing. Be clean. Immediately the man was cleaned of his leprosy, a cleanse of his leprosy. And what happens? The crowd goes wild. As if Justin Timberlake just walked out on stage. The crowd goes wild. Wild, yeah! It's like the guy who makes the 55-yard putt to win the Masters. Ah! Wild! This man is healed. What a great moment. Best sermon of all time. And Jesus heals a man with leprosy. But then there's a shift. Then there's a shift. Jesus does something that stuns everyone. In the next 12 minutes, I'm going to endeavor to finish this, and if we don't, we'll just pick it up next week, because I'm going to leave you hanging. Either way, I'm going to leave you hanging. This is a suspense thriller. Jesus does something. It's stunning, okay? Now, I don't mean this in any weird way, but it's so stunning. It's stunning in the way of, like, you're snuggling on the couch with your girlfriend. You're about 17 years old, and her dad walks in the room and turns the light on. <laughs> Am I going to die? Or is this okay? Because everybody got different house rules. Everybody got different house rules. In my dating relationships with my wife, because I've never dated anybody else other than my wife, Her father would walk in the room even if we weren't even just, we were just on the same couch together and he'd say something in Spanish. Still don't know what he said. <laughs> and she would just jump up and push me like to, all the way to the other end of the couch. Something like it don't look right or something like that. Everybody's look, like if people saw it don't look right. As if somebody, anyway, I'm scarred. I'm scarred. This is one of those moments everyone's like, yeah, they're running around, ah, oh, Jesus. And then he just lost his dang mind. <laughs> That's how it is. It's like, Err! the light just came on. Do you know this next story? Matthew 8, verse 5. When Jesus has entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking him for help. Like, 
I know that might not mean a whole lot. So I have to give you a History Channel lesson. Everyone was excited about Jesus healing the sick Jewish man because it was their people. The man with leprosy was my people. Let's keep it in the family. Let's keep it in our culture. Let's keep it in our skin color. Let's keep it in our ethnic group. Let's keep it there. He, it was all good while Jesus was doing it for Jewish people. But now a centurion walks in and he asks for help. It was cool helping our people, but help a centurion? No way. We can't even imagine the magnitude of this moment, everyone. Help others? Love your enemy? Okay, great sermon, but what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now that our enemy is in front of us? A hundred years ago, before this moment, a hundred years before this moment, the general uh, Roman, his name was Pomp, enters the city of Jerusalem and desecrates the temple. He pulls back the veil and walks into the holies of holies. You can't do that. He walks into the holies of holies because he's looking for this God, this God Jehovah that everybody fears, this God Jehovah that would take your life. And, and, if, and if there wasn't a physical God, he was at least looking for an idol or a statue and it wasn't there. When he finds that it's not there, he gets angry. He, he begins to make these slurs like, you guys are a bunch of fools. And at least you could do is have an idol. And he takes hundreds of Jewish people as slaves. In that moment, those cities lost their independence and now became owned by Rome. Owned by Rome. When Jesus was in his late 20s. Pontius Pilate was placed into power. Pontius Pilate, check this out, Pontius Pilate is the one who introduced crucifixion as a form of capital punishment. The way that Jesus would eventually lose his life. So there was major tension between the Jewish people and the Romans. Okay, so what? This centurion, he wasn't just a normal Roman soldier. He was of the elite. They were known to earn, earn their recognition by their violence, by their hatefulness. Centurions obeyed commands without question, and they acted without conscience. Can you see how startling this moment is? Jesus has his crowds of followers, and now by a person who is most hated and feared, this man's asking their teacher, their rabbi, for help. When everyone runs and hides, I want you to get this, Jesus is approachable. When everyone runs from this centurion, Jesus is approachable. Jesus allows the ugliest parts of our lives to approach him. He allows the ugliest parts of our lives, the most, that, that thing that we have feared the most to come out, that secret that we've hidden so deep, Jesus allows that to approach him. Let me ask you something today. If someone wronged you and then they came and asked you for a favor, how would you respond? If someone stole from you and then came and asked you to borrow some money, if someone hurt one of your family members and then came and asked you for forgiveness, this is that situation. Family members were killed by this guy. Do good for someone who loves me is easy. Giving a gift to someone who buys me a Christmas gift, easy. But do good to someone who hurt me, 
lend to someone who stole from me? Jesus, this is just too much. This is just too much. It was great when we were on the mountain and we were all rallying and it was all secret and stuff. But this just got real, man. Stuff just got real. Becoming a Christian is easy. Salvation is free. It only costs you one breath. I believe. But following Jesus, applying the Sermon on the Mount to our lives, that's difficult. That's difficult. In fact, it's actually unnatural. It's unnatural to turn the other cheek. In fact, it's supernatural. It's supernatural. <laughs> and that's Jesus' point. That's Jesus' point. That, that, that when you accept me and you believe in me, you'll step out of the natural life. You will step into the supernatural life. The fruit of the Spirit will begin to be manifest through you. And these attitudes and these behaviors will become easier. Now watch this. This part in Luke 6.33. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Even sinners buy each other Christmas gifts. He said that, that part is easy. Jesus preached this. But now he's being asked for a favor from a murderer. Everyone holds their breath. And we're going to finish this story next week. But before we do, before we do, I want to read to you Matthew 8, 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking him for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Oxymoron moment. A man known for inflicting suffering is worried about someone's suffering. You are the poster child for creating this kind of harm. And now you want Jesus to do something to get you out of this. Come on, somebody. Come on, hey, come on somebody. This is, this is where church people get pissed at other people. Oh, you're going to go sin? You're going to go do your own sin? And then you're going to ask Jesus to get you out? Yeah! Yeah! Yo, you ain't thinking about Jesus when you're at the club. Yeah, but guess what? I'm thinking about him now. Because I need him. Because I need him. Because I need him. I need him now. Jesus taught to love your enemies, and here's the opportunity. Quick note, this centurion is part of the empire that will eventually kill Jesus. And he knows it. He knows it. Jesus already knows his fate. He already knows that this guy is going to be part of the crucifixion process. If you legalistic watching me right now, you might want to shut me off. You might want to log off Facebook real quick. Think about this. Jesus knows this guy's going to do it again. And he's still willing to help him. He knows he's going to do it again. It's like, it's like that movie Saving Private Ryan. Saw that movie where the guy doesn't, doesn't kill somebody. And later on the guy ends up killing somebody. And he watches it. This is that same scene. What did Jesus say? Verse 7, what did Jesus say? Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Basically, Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. Your place or my place? Am I going to your house with you? Shall I go? Shall we go now? Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's pick it up. Let's pack it up. Let's go. I'll do it. I'm willing. Let's go. Shall I follow you to your house or shall you follow me? And 
And the crowd is like, Jesus, you've gone too far, man. You've gone too far. Being a Jesus follower requires you to go too far past natural understanding. Matthew 8.8, 8, watch this. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve for you to come under the roof of my house. The crowd's like, darn right. Darn right, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve nothing about Jesus. Finally, finally, something about this conversation makes sense. But Jesus sees faith in this centurion that he hasn't seen even in his own apostles. Matthew 8, 8, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve you to come under the roof of my house, but just say the word. Just speak the word. Just speak the word. Just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Verse 9, for I myself am a man under authority with, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I don't need you to come to my house, he says. Just speak the word. Just speak the word, and it'll work. The word will work. The word will work. The word will work. The word will work. At your word, my servant will be healed. And we're going to continue this conversation next week. We're going to see what happens, what the turning point is, what the result of these Jesus followers seeing Jesus live out his word. I just want to ask you today in closing, are you speaking the word in your situation? Are you speaking the word of God over your children? Are you speaking the word of God over your finances? Are you speaking the word of God over your job? Or are you just praying, help me God questions? Are you speaking the word? Because the man knew at the word, at the authority of the word, something happened, not just speaking, not just praying. I'm asking you today, do you have a Bible verse that you're standing on for each situation of your life. If not, if not, just throwing this out there, if not, you are not guaranteed the results that Jesus had. Because if we're not following the example, if we're not following what he did, we're not guaranteed the results he had. Have you settled for Christian? Or are you following Jesus Christ I want to ask you today could you be a Jesus follower could we take the teachings of his word and apply them to our lives even when it's uncomfortable even when it's not popular it won't be easy at first I'm, I'm not saying it's ever going to be easy but the more you do it it's less hard you get into that routine and into that practice as we close out today, I'm going to pray for those in the room and those watching online. I'm also going to pray for the offering. We are in a position still with the state that we cannot pass buckets that multiple people touch. So we have giving baskets at the doors and in the lobby. We are currently, uh, f we're just right there. We're about $2,000 away from uh, being able to recarpet this room and have a fresh look. Did anybody notice the fresh look of the Welcome Center out front? Did you notice that? Okay. So we're starting a few little remodels, little inexpensive remodels to kind of bring the new look and feel of, of what things are going to be like here at Family Church. But today I'm just ask you this, this week, your homework assignment. Continue to ask yourselves, the way I'm treating people, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm feeling, is it a Jesus follower way? Or am I just wearing the Christian t-shirt and then trying to conform it to what is comfortable and easy. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us the strength, the boldness, and the courage to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We thank you that the word today will be planted deep in our hearts, that will produce fruit, that, that will remain. We thank you, Lord, today as we sow into your kingdom that it comes back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, 
and running over. We thank you that we are blessed today. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. Have a great weekend.